There's a home in Dolby, Louisiana. A home to a loving father, mother, and their growing set of children. And they're ready to make you one of their own. When Resident Evil 7 was released in 2017, it was the injection of new life that the franchise needed after going so far off the rails so fast that fans were worried the series they loved would never find its footing again. And while the story of a man's search for his missing wife and the terrifying family that keeps them apart is the true heir to Shinji Mikami's original Resident Evil and its remake, no fan could predict what was coming for the franchise. Gone were the characters that players had known for decades, the tropes that made even the scariest RE games comforting, and the cartoonish moments that brought both intentional and unintentional comedy. In their place was a truly dark and intense story designed to frighten players in ways the series had never done before. But was this still the Resident Evil that fans had stuck by for decades, through both highs and lows? Or had the franchise truly moved on from what had come to define it? The changes made put Resident Evil on a new path, and in conjunction with the remakes of RE2 and 3, began the modern rebirth of the series. As we journey into a modern heart of darkness, we'll discuss the major creative changes that led to RE7, the auteurist horror films that directly influenced its new approach to terror, and what makes this story of Ethan, Mia, and the Baker family that brought this franchise back from the grave into Resident Evil's most terrifying story. Welcome to the family, son. <laughs> Resident Evil 7 was released on January 4th, 2017. But to really understand the importance of Ethan Winter's fight against the Baker family, we have to briefly travel back to 2012. Yes, the year that Resident Evil 6 was released. And I don't know if there are any two back-to-back -back games that are as completely different as the shift between RE6 and 7. While the full story of RE6 will be told in a future video, what's important to note is that this globe-spanning, multi-story entry was the end of the line for the second wave of RE. You can divide Capcom's franchise into three trilogies when it comes to the mainline games. The classic survival horror of the first three, the action extravaganza of 4 through 6, and the new wave of survival horror in 7, 8, and probably whatever will come in 9. 4 had revitalized the franchise with its fast-paced approach that was less survival and more battle, which 5 took to another level with its daytime co-op story. All the while, the story of the fight against Umbrella and the various forces that took its place in bioterrorism grew more and more prominent in the series. 6 is all lore and heavy narrative playing off years of games. What was once background to the horror thrill of early entries was now the selling point and the result was a poor reception from fans and critics, and deeply disappointing sales. Just a few years later, Hideo Kojima's PT was released, and while Konami cancelled the Silent Hill game it teased, its intimate first-person approach to survival horror was a lightning rod to fans who had grown disillusioned with Ari's direction. It was clear that Capcom and the RE team needed to completely rethink their franchise, or risk killing their money-making juggernaut. So the initial plans for another action-focused sequel were quickly reworked to focus once again on survival horror, this time embracing the small scale, with a location and type of horror initially inspired by Sam Raimi's The Evil Dead. Powered by the newly created RE engine, Resident Evil 7 was directed by Koshi Nakanishi, produced by Mashichika Kawada and Toyoshi Kanda, designed by Hajime Horiuchi and Kyosuke Yamakawa, 
and written by Morimasa Sato and Richard Piercy, with music composed by Akiyuki Morimoto, Miwako Chinone, and Satoshi Hori. The biggest breakaway from other games that Seven makes, and one that informs its entire style and approach to horror, is the decision to adopt a first-person view. Of course, first-person had already been employed in RE multiple times before, and was the hallmark of many other survival horror franchises, but had never been used in one of the series' mainline games. If the fixed camera view of the original games made you more of an observer of the horror, and 4 through 6's over-the-shoulder camera gave you mobility that empowered you, 7's first-person view works to create immediacy within horror. Giving you the ability to put your hands up to lessen the damage is still scary, because we're made aware of those hands' vulnerability early on. Having maps and inventory pop up as a live overlay prevents players from breaking immersion. Now everything has to be done in the moment, instead of stopping time to smoke up some of that helpful green. I think the more personal horror becomes, the scarier it becomes, said director Koshi Nakanishi. I think this comes from the fact that it's easier for the player to imagine themselves in the circumstance. Back when I was a teenager, I used to borrow my parents' car and drive out to scary locations with my friends. Why? Because it was free. It was a wonderful way to keep ourselves entertained for a low, low price. I never thought that 20 years later I would be using that experience in my work. I took the core team members out to some scary locations to help create Resident Evil 7, since I figured what better way to figure out how to scare consumers than experiencing fear for yourself. Most importantly, RE7 makes a hard break away from decades of stories by starting off completely removed from anything that came before. No T-Virus, no Umbrella, no pre-established characters. Eventually, the game will make its connections clearer. But for now, we're put in the role of Ethan Winters, who has received a message from his wife, Mia, who went missing three years ago. Ethan arrives in Dolby, Louisiana at the Baker Estate. And even though it's immediately clear that something is horribly wrong, you'll never be able to guess just how deep the rot goes. Regarding the major change in direction, producer Masachika Kawata said, We had to prioritize and figure out what do we want to put in this to make sure it's the next flagship title. We made sure that what we did put in there really focused on the fact that this is more of an intimate, more personal experience in terms of the storytelling. But at the same time, because it is taking place after Resident Evil 6, and it's still in the same Resident Evil universe, I think if you do play the game and you do check out the details, you'll be able to see some of those themes that you were able to see in previous games. Naming the game Resident Evil 7 Biohazard in North America, and Biohazard 7 Resident Evil in Japan, is a fun way of blending the two naming conventions in one game. But to me, it also represents the series fully living up to the potential of its North American name. This is a story focused on the corruption of an American family unit, and how horror is expressed through familial ties. Seen the other way, and it draws attention to the hidden contamination within the Baker home. And that residence is playing off familiarity to mine its horror. Most Resident Evil settings are somewhat removed from reality, like the Spencer Mansion in the original or the rural Spanish village and castle of RE4. These aren't settings that most players would have encountered in real life. Instead, Seven is most like the civilization breakdown encapsulated in the stories of Raccoon City's fall. In games like RE2 and 3, the familiar is turned into the necropolis on a large scale. Seven keeps a smaller scale, and in doing so, is focused on highly detailed grotesqueries by taking a normal family home and filling it with rot. Really, rot is the key to the horror. Rot of houses, rot of bodies, rot of minds. The most effective use of this comes at the game's start, as we arrive at the home and sense that something is off. Then, once captured, we're forced into a disturbing family dinner and must escape from Jack by moving through garages, kitchens, and living rooms, with little space to hide. These are the most normal settings of the entire game, but by turning them into a landlord's worst nightmare, they're so close to reality that they become truly disturbing. 
and although the game retains its fairly small scope, it does expand as we progress into a larger home, a really fucked up old house on the property that was clearly the first residence on the land, and different set pieces that are just a little too big to maintain the game's sense of familiarity. I don't think giant tankers explode and crash into Louisiana bayous all that often, but I haven't been keeping up with environmental news. That's the difficult line that RE7 is trying to walk, providing visceral, grounded scares, while still embracing gamification. Mia's first transformation is frightening because it's so intimate. We don't know the rules of this game's horror yet, and we're almost entirely unarmed, followed by our literal unarming by our once-loving wife. Few games would take the chance of cutting off the player's hand in the opening minutes, but that's what makes Seven so unpredictable and disturbing. We're suddenly very aware of the vulnerability of the body we're residing in. Hand trauma, dude. It'll leave an impression. Of course, once Ethan's arm is sewn back on with little after effects, we're unfortunately made very aware of the game's limitations as, well, a game that still needs to be playable for its duration. You're gonna need two hands to reload, shoot, open doors, climb ladders, and generally do the things that games need you to do. The visceral immediacy of RE7's horror and its gameplay mechanics frequently bump up against each other. Early on, there's nothing but a knife to defend yourself. Later, fancy bombs seem to be available by the dozen. There are lots of smaller details that make Seven so great. The sound design in particular is incredible, filling the space with your character's breathing that changes with their fear, and letting you hear bumps, scratches, and moans that keep you on edge. Making the Baker Estate a living and breathing place even when there's no enemy that's actually been spawned nearby. At first, it seems like anything could happen to your lead character. But eventually, Faceless Ethan becomes a little too invincible. Self-empowerment is the name of every RE game, overcoming the odds and gaining the power to stop the horror. And that's no exception here. Ethan Winters is almost a complete cipher. No background, no real characteristics. The commitment to not showing his face, even when in Mia's perspective, is almost comical. Ethan is the most everyman character in the franchise, although the choice to give him a voice and provide him with one defining trait, a desperate love for his wife, helps him to not be anonymous. It also helps players better connect with his story. It's very simple motivation. If someone you loved went missing for years only to reappear in desperate need of your help, wouldn't you do anything to get them back? Mia's betrayal, lies, transformation, and remorse make us call the relationship into question. But when it comes to Seven's one story-changing choice, I don't think it's enough to make us choose Zoe over Mia. I appreciate the ability to make a choice in a game that's pretty linear, but Mia is, after all, the reason we've gone through hell. And that hell is pulled from very different sources than any Resident Evil that came before. To really unpack what makes Seven so refreshing and legitimately scary in the context of the franchise, you have to examine the horror influences of this reset compared to what came before. Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3 are all pulled from classic George Romero zombies and Lucio Fulci's supernatural zombie take. RE4 blends European myth and cults with Lovecraftian body horror. Resident Evil 5 and 6 are very much focused on the giant monsters and civil unrest already established in earlier entries, which makes them less thematically interesting. But RE7, with its minimalist approach to horror and dedication to the corruption of everyday life, is pulling from the new wave of horror auteurs that started in the late 70s, with each major section reflecting a different subgenre. The Evil Dead from 1981 was cited as the initial inspiration for the entirety of the game, and it's very obvious in both its location and type of villain faced. While the Baker family is corrupted by a mold bioweapon, their turn into murderous psychosis from an outside influence, and the unwitting survivors lured into a seemingly normal home that houses evil, reflects Raimi's cabin set single location classic. It's just that while the Evil Dead was centered on demonic possession, the horrors of Seven come from a scientific origin. And just like Raimi's film, 
The monsters here want to spread their corruption, and regular people suffer horrifying disfigurement. Jack's chainsaw duel, complete with Ash Williams' catchphrase, Rudy. lets us in on the joke. Evil Dead 2 is the greatest movie ever made, by the way. It's also pretty clear that, as a whole, Toby Hooper's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a major influence on this story of a backwoods family horror. This 1974 proto-slasher also sees a group of characters drawn toward an old house in the middle of nowhere that houses a psychotic family. And like the Bakers, the Sawyers are a dark mirror of the modern American nuclear family, preying on regular people drawn into their web. It's also clear that the Bakers eat people too. The discoveries made by Ethan and the playable demos show that, just like Chainsaw, there have been countless people killed by the Bakers. Really, it's our journey through the main house and fight to escape from Jack's twisted home that is most reflective of Texas Chainsaw. And Jack himself is a degraded vision of a father, protective of the home, forcing Ethan to prove himself as worthy of his so-called daughter, Mia. Once Jack's section is finished, Ethan must face Marguerite's in the old house. And here, Marguerite's section feels the most indebted to the original Evil Dead because of her hag-like appearance, physical transformation, and cabin-like home. Marguerite's motherhood is lived out through her transformation into a bug colony, giving birth to nests and even housing one in her womb. Next, the traps and puzzle focus section headed by Lucas clearly reflects Saw. The impromptu industrial nature of Lucas's maze is very much like Jigsaw's methods. And while nothing that Lucas does is nearly as disgusting as the Saw movies, his unfair methods and recorded messages reflect the franchise. While the Not A Hero DLC would show Lucas's mold infection, it's never seen in the main game, making you question if he's been corrupted or just gone insane. Lucas is that annoying younger gamer brother whose room you wouldn't dare step in. Shout out to all the disgusting little shitboy Lucases in the comments. Mia, the surrogate daughter, and Zoe, the actual daughter, are the only ones who have a chance of being saved. The Blair Witch Project can be seen as a direct comparison to the game's first-person perspective, but it's most explicit in the many found footage moments encountered through the game's videotapes that let players relive past victims' lo-fi last moments. When combined with the Baker Estate's isolated location, RE7 is emphasizing an analog approach to horror, despite being made in the modern age of advanced game technology. Everything is degraded, rotting, and extremely low-tech. Except for that sweet watch, of course. And personally, I've always found that removing technology from your horror stories makes them much more isolating and scary. Seven quickly takes the last shred of hope in Sheriff Anderson and unceremoniously offs him in a Shining-esque manner. The later sections of the wrecked ship and salt mines play more off industrial horror and honestly, while I don't think these sections are bad, they're not nearly as scary as what came before. Part of that is because the horror of these areas is much broader. You've seen rundown industrial areas in dozens of games and hundreds of movies. And part of that is because the tense, truly scary, and unpredictable nature of those early hours slowly gives way to something a little more typically RE and less fresh. You know, shady secret organizations, giant monsters with eyes all over them, heavy weaponry that blows away the threats that were previously terrifying. The molded are very clearly inserted to give the game a little more of the typical physical threat of mainstream horror games and, while providing extra tension, undermine the atypical scares of what the game seems to initially set up before their basement surprise. Not all of these sections work as well as the rest, and it could be easy for these to become really aesthetically disjointed from one another. However, they do share a running theme of familial corruption and pull from horror movies that generally place a corrupting force within the modern home. And they're tied together by another horror influence, Ring. Hideo Nakata's 1998 film, and its 2002 remake by Gore Verbinski. Evelyn is very much like Sadako or Samara, a mysterious, deadly, psychic girl haunted by a corrupted childhood whose horror is expressed through familial imagery. Her true form as an elderly, wheelchair-bound woman ties back to Texas Chainsaw and its darkly comedic grandpa. Evelyn's desire for a family is unsettling because it places a child in the role of authority, subjugating everyone to her will. Still, files discovered near the end of the game suggest that Evelyn has all the personality traits of a young girl, and her isolation and experimentation made her desperate to create a family, even a twisted vision of one. 
It's almost tragic. If she didn't become a huge goopy tentacle monster at the end that was just begging to be blowed up. The Baker family's horror is playing with tropes of backwoods generations gone into hiding and gone feral in the process. It's the horror of human regression outside the boundaries of civilization that was crystallized in Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Wes Craven's The Hills Have Eyes. When done poorly, that style of the so-called civilized versus uncivilized can be really stereotypical and lacking nuance. But Seven throws players a tragic curveball late in the game. Imprisoned by Evelyn's mold, Ethan has a vision of Jack and Zoe, back to their normal selves and mourning their actions, and the corruption of what was once a loving, regular family. Evelyn's powers and supposed gift to them corrupted their hearts and minds alongside their bodies, not only trapping them in this sudden onset of madness, but even making them like it. There's no going back for the Bakers, only the release of death that Jack begs for. Free my family. Please. And I think that's one of the scariest pieces of this game. It's far beyond bodily dismemberment or abduction. It's the fear that pure chance could take a normal, happy family and turn them into a grotesque nightmare, trapped in a rotting shell of their former lives. It's disturbing on multiple levels and makes replays of the game where instead of the horror of the unknown, we have the horror of a family torn apart, even more disturbing. In its final hours, RE7 reveals all of its secrets, putting players in Mia's shoes for a flashback that reveals her involvement in the bioweapon organization The Connections, and their creation of Evelyn as a bioweapon pushing a heavily armed Ethan through the salt mines for a firefight to the finish, and the final confrontation revealing Evelyn as a rapidly aging woman turned monster. In the end, there are certain elements that are undeniable about any Resident Evil game, and bombastic boss battles will never be fully removed. In the days leading up to Seven's debut, producer Masuchika Kawata assured fans who were put off by the stripped down nature of the game's demos that, yes, this is a focus on horror more than action, but at the end of the day, we're still providing a Resident Evil title. Once you actually do play the game, you'll immediately recognize that, okay, this very much feels like a Resident Evil game, even though the visuals might be a little bit different. There are a lot of familiar elements that fans will be able to recognize. Safe rooms, analog safe systems, herbs, overly complex puzzles that no one in their right mind would ever think of adding to their home. Don't worry, Jack had a contractor. These are all there from the start. In essence, the Baker residence is a revisitation of the Spencer Mansion. You know, normal seeming place that has a history of tragedy and a hidden underground area for experimentation that you find late in the game. These elements make RE7 the true heir to Mikami's original, and its focus on truly scaring players. As I discussed in my video on Resident Evil 1 and its remake, there are two poles in this franchise that every game moves between. The silly stuff, both intentional and unintentional, side of the original RE, and the very straightforward, scary stuff of the remake. There is no game more aligned with Mikami's remake than 7. Personally, I love the elements of Seven that are the most stripped down, and whose horror comes from intimate encounters with evil, and whose aesthetics are subdued and closer to reality. Knowing that there could be molded around any corner adds the classic sense of tension cultivated from the original game's loading screen doors and zombies. Unless you're Uncle Joe, who can just punch them to death. Survival horror immersion? Screw your immersion. I'm a powerbomb swamp thing. In early stages of development, the Baker family was intended to be larger, but they were scaled back as Seven's story and character relationships became clearer. If Nakanishi and company had kept their focus on providing players with more of the one-on-one -on -one terror seen in the early Jack areas, it probably would have kept Seven from feeling more like generic RE toward its end. How you feel about that balance in this refresh of the series probably depends on what your favorite RE games are, and which of the horror movie inspirations that I listed you love the most. Personally, I still enjoy every section of the game, even if it feels like its story has three natural stopping points. The boat escape from the estate, Mia's journey through the ship and memory recovery, and its actual end. In any case, RE7 ends like every entry in the mainline series. This one long night has finally come to an end, and with the dawn, we fight the final humongous monster with the assistance of some extra heavy weaponry. 
flying away from the horror and finding peace as the sun rises. That combination of new life and familiar staples forming into something new was more than enough to bring both old and new fans into the Baker estate. Not only were players and critics thrilled with the game, but 7 became the third best debut in the series history, going on to sell more than 11 million copies in its lifetime. The result was that mainline Resident Evil was re-established as centering around the type of horror, gameplay, and characters of 7. Fans who wanted the classic characters of RE would have to rely mostly on Capcom's remakes of previous games, also successful in their own right. But for now, the story of Ethan Winters and the Mold, which could have easily been wrapped up in Seven's contained story, and the DLC chapters that tied up its loose ends, would continue in Village, which combined Seven's first-person scares with a bigger scale, greater focus on action, much wilder caricatures, and an expansion on the backstory and lore that existed on the edges of Seven's highly focused horror once again pushing the game back toward the fun and silly pole defined by the original. But no matter how many retcons, sequels, and expansions the story of Ethan and Mia Winters might have, the horror of the Baker family and Evelyn will always be Resident Evil's most terrifying story. Thanks for watching today's video and happy Resi December Evil! This is the final video for this month and the final video for the year, so thank you for coming on this journey with me. I've had so much fun talking about Resident Evil this month. It's been really fun and refreshing and I've just loved delving into so many different corners of this franchise. And I felt that there would be no better way to wrap up Resident December Evil than to bring it all back to the really scary side of RE. Personally, 7 is easily one of my favorite games in the entire franchise. I don't have a definitive ranking, but it's top 3 for sure. And I think that the hard reset that it did for the series approach to horror is really interesting to dive into. And it makes sense why I love it so much because the Evil Dead franchise and Texas Chainsaw Massacre are some of my favorite horror movies of all time. So if you're an RE fan and you've never watched those movies, I say that you should immediately check them out. And the undercurrent of familial horror and tragedy really gives the Baker family a lot of pathos that a lot of other characters in RE don't have. Ethan Winters is pretty anonymous in Seven, but I think that's kind of the point of the whole thing. Again, it's about immediacy and intimacy in horror. So putting you in his shoes and his very messed up hands does that really well. Obviously, I think that the high point of the game comes in those early hours, as you're really getting a grasp on the rules of everything. And the Chainsaw Duel is just so much sick, twisted fun. I'd love to hear your thoughts on RE7, where it fits in your ranking of RE games, your favorite of the horror movie influences on this installment, and maybe even what was your favorite video in this year's Resident December Evil. The month has gone really well, so thank you all for your support. And this means that you can look forward to Resident December Evil 2, coming at the end of 2023. There's still so many topics for me to cover in this franchise. And by then, the RE4 remake will be out too, so maybe I'll cover that in next year's Resident December Evil. In any case, thank you for watching, and thank you to my patrons for their continued support. If you'd like to be a patron, it's only a dollar a month for early access to every video and exclusive Patreon-only reviews. And for Resident December Evil, I've done a full week of exclusive reviews, including a special Dare Sember Lives Again, where I talk about the first six issues of Chip Zdarsky's new Daredevil volume, and read two Daredevil video essays that I never finished and never published. So if you're still itching for Dare Sember, go there. So until next time, I hope that you're all taking care of yourselves. Happy New Year and happy Resident December Evil.